Sure, that's very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, and you made it this far, you're going to graduate. I think that's awesome. So, um, what's the plan? I, I'm going to tell you about three people that taught me life lessons, and I'll share those lessons with you. And all these lessons I learned the hard way through life experience. So, the chance that you will learn something just by listening to me seems kind of low. But I'm going to try anyway um, and tell you a little bit about my life. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll all learn something. So uh, first I'm gonna tell you about my mom. When I teach CS61A, has anyone taken CS61A? 
<laughs> I always end the last lecture with a story about my mom, and uh, I'm going to tell that story again. But first, I'm going to tell a different story, a story that I've never told a student in the history of my being here, because it's deeply embarrassing. So, <laughs> but, but I'll give you some sense of what, what my mom is like. So, um, so she was a great mom. Um, she tried to raise me to be like a decent human being, and sometimes I would disappoint her in that respect. Uh, I, um, I, was, I was in high school. It was the early days of the internet, 1996, 97, somewhere in there. And I had acquired a document off of the internet called the Anarchist's Cookbook. <laughs> I, I won't make you raise your hand if you've read it, because you might get arrested. OK, so this was a document that had been compiled over the decades and then released on the internet that described how to make bombs, <laughs> among other things. And uh, you know, as a teenage boy, I thought it was so cool just to read about making bombs. Making bombs, I didn't want to do. Like, I was risk averse. I didn't want to blow my fingers off. <laughs> but, but reading about the idea of the chemistry behind it, I mean, that was really exciting to me. And um, then I got to this page about a smoke bomb, which isn't a real bomb, right? It just makes smoke. And so I thought, like, oh, I could make that. <laughs> so. Uh, it gave a description of the ingredients and how to make it. It said, buy some potassium nitrate and some sugar, mix them together. Potassium nitrate, it turns out, you can buy from a pharmacy. It's just like some chemical compound, which has you know, questionable medical uses, but you can buy it from a pharmacy. Except, pharmacies don't carry it. You have to call in in special order. And at the time, I was very shy. I was terrified of adults. And the idea of calling up a pharmacist and saying, I need to order potassium nitrate, like that was the scariest thing in the world for me. So I just, I just wouldn't do that. But I really wanted this stuff to make my smoke bomb, so I asked my mom. <laughs> I say, hi, mom, can, I, can you order me some potassium nitrate? <laughs> and she said, what's it for? And I said, oh, just some chemistry experiment I want to do. And she's a great mom, so she's like, okay. <laughs> so a week later, she shows up at home, and she bought me this jar. And, uh, and I go to work. So I uh, get an old dog food can and some tongs, and I mix the ingredients together, just like it told me. I was in the kitchen. My parents were upstairs. <laughs> and I turn on the stove, and I get a spoon, and I start stirring this mixture of potassium nitrate and sugar. And the direction said it was supposed to turn into a goo, and then once it's a goo, you're supposed to let it get hard, and then you're done, and then you like light it on fire and it makes smoke. So I was stirring, but no goo. And I hadn't like cooked a lot before, so I didn't know what was wrong. Like I thought maybe the fire wasn't hot enough or something like that. So, um, so I decided to take a spoonful of the mixture of these powders and put it directly over the flame. <laughs> Not a proud moment. <laughs> So what happens when you take the ingredients of a bomb and put it into fire? Well, it explodes, right? Because my spoon started burning and like billowing white smoke everywhere. And I was like, oh, crap. So what do you do in this situation when you have a burning spoon? Well, I doused it in the can. <laughs> which was full of smoke bomb ingredients. <laughs> It was, it was amazing. <laughs> like two feet of flame shot. And like white smoke started billowing everywhere. And these little like fragments of material like shot up into the ceiling like stalactites. And they were smoking. And uh, the room was filled with smoke. It all lasted like two seconds. Then it was gone. And 
then my mom came downstairs. <laughs> um, and she said, are you okay? I said, everything's fine. She said, what happened? And then I had to explain the whole thing, the internet and the cookbook <laughs> and, the and, the, and the spoon and everything. And, uh, and she could like barely see me through all the smoke. <laughs> the smoke alarm went off. Um, and the amazing thing is she didn't throw me out of the house. <laughs> Instead, like in that moment, she thought of a punishment that would be perfectly fitting of the crime and maybe help me grow up a little bit. She said, John, you are the one who has to go outside and meet the firefighters when they arrive. <laughs> And you will explain to them <laughs> what happened here. Well, like I said, I was terrified of adults. Like, this is the nightmare for me. But I was not, like, in a bargaining position to say no. So, yeah, so I went outside, and the fire engine showed up, and they, the firefighters piled out, and they saw me. And I said, everything's fine, no fire. <laughs> like, smoke was billowing out of the <laughs> So I had to explain to them what I had done, and I was certain they were going to arrest me. Now, firefighters do not arrest me. This is not a reasonable fear, but, um, but you know, they told me I was wrong. They, I don't know exactly what they said, but they made me feel like an idiot, because I was an idiot. And, um, I guess that's why I'm telling you this story. One reason is to show you that, you know, your professors are idiots. <laughs> that, you know, even people who find their way in the world and, and find something that, they're, that they really like doing uh, have, have done things in the past that maybe they're not proud of. But the second thing is, just to show you how cool my mom is, and the story I always tell at the end of 61A is not this story. It's a story about my wedding day when... So this is May 5th, 2007. I'm about to get married, got the whole tuxedo on, everything. And my mom pulls me aside before the ceremony, and she says, John, I want to tell you something. And I thought it was going to be like, you know, be nice to your wife or something like that. <laughs> but it wasn't. She said only two words. And uh, I wonder if any of you remember them. Do they remember the two words she said? Probably not. She said, don't compare. And that really stuck with me. That, was, that phrase really kind of changed my life. To me, it meant that all of the things that I do in my life, whatever I accomplish, whatever I learn, whatever I know, whatever I'm able to do, are really about me. They're not about other people. And just because somebody else did more doesn't diminish what I've done. And just because somebody did less doesn't mean that I need to somehow set my expectations lower. Instead, I just focus on like the absolute value of, of what I do in the world. And uh, that was a hard thing to accept because I was young and I had gone through college and even though I had been out for a little while, I was still used to that college mindset where everyone's being compared to everybody else all the time, right? There's like points everywhere, and there's grades everywhere, and you know, you gotta apply to clubs you wanna be in, and uh, yeah, even applying to jobs out of school is, it seems like a lot of comparison. Like everyone's got the same degrees or different degrees, and it seems like you're being asked all the same interview questions. <laughs> this is something that's gonna change radically in your life. The idea that you can kind of just rank people based on common evaluations and tests. Like, that's over. Unless you're going to credit school. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but out there in the world, like, people do entirely different things. And so they're on entirely different paths. And they become completely incomparable to each other. And... Um, yeah, this whole notion of kind of comparing people and who got, you know, what score on some test and standard deviations above the mean, just gone. <laughs> Instead, people are just out there trying to do useful stuff or get what they want or whatever motivations they have. And, of course, people still apply to stuff. 
but it's chaos out there. I mean, it's uh, totally incompetent people get jobs that they shouldn't have. <laughs> and great candidates get rejected for the stupidest reasons. And uh, this is upsetting for a lot of students who are used to the college system. They kind of want it to be the case that your <coughs> merits and your ability somehow dictate your rewards and uh, your opportunities. But that's just not how it is in the world. Instead, uh, there's a lot of chaos and a lot of uh, weird allocations of things. So um, that's going to be probably upsetting to some of you, uh, but it could be a great relief. And what do I mean by great relief? Well, if you embrace this notion of don't compare, then it's actually a gift that you can't really compare people out there in the world anyway. Like, you take two people, they lived entirely different lives, you can't really tell who's successful and who's not successful anymore. I mean, you can look at their bank account, but probably both of them will have enough to get by. Uh, and they'll have such different desires that you can't really tell, like, who's got what they need and who doesn't. And instead, it's just a bunch of people off doing, doing things that they care about. So that's like the world outside of college that you're about to experience. And I encourage you to, yeah, kind of enjoy it because the inability to compare can be very liberating. Instead, you just focus on yourself, you know, what you can do. Um, and I mentioned that if you can't do anything, then you should like learn to do something. But <laughs> Uh, what, you can do, uh, what you can do, and not worry about comparing yourself with anybody else, but instead just like pick something you care about and go for it. Okay, so that's lesson one. Lesson one is about chaos and what you will experience in the future. Lesson two is about dedication. So when I talk to alumni who have been out for more than 10 years, and they ask me, what do you do? I tell them. I'm the new Brian Harvey. And you're like, who? <laughs> but to them, this is like, wow, that's cool. Have any of you met Brian Harvey? Oh, you're a lucky folk. Okay, so. This guy taught CS61A for 25 years. He made it part of the culture of UC Berkeley. He was fantastic at it. He was revered. He was a legend. I mean, he uh, was so good at executing this course that you know the students loved him, and you know they take this course first, and then they take all the other courses, and then go back to him and say, uh, "Your course was the best out of all." I mean, he was great, and, um, and yeah, he was one of my heroes before I even met him, and then I got to know him, and he's still one of my heroes. I mean, amazing guy. And when I got to know him, he taught me what I think of as dedication. So let me tell you what that means. Um, 61A was different back when he taught it. It was all taught in scheme. <laughs> <laughs> week one, week 15, all scheme. And some students just love it. And some students complained that it was like some irrelevant language that no one used in industry. And those students were wrong. It wasn't irrelevant. It was full of beautiful ideas. I mean, it was a beautiful part. And Brian wanted to retire. So he was looking for someone else to teach this course. And he had like done it so well that kind of no one was willing to step into his shoes. Except for I was wandering around in the world, and I didn't have like a proper fear of failure, and so I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, I also said, I'm going to change some things. And uh, yeah, change the programming language, change the order of the topics. I even took out some topics that were just like beautiful topics, you know. Now we learn about the object system in Python. Back then, you would build your own object system from scratch, not functional. It was like awesome. <laughs> and I, I had my reasons, but I basically took this perfect course and just like threw it on the ground, <laughs> trashed it, and started gluing it back together, <laughs> and, like leaving pieces on the ground. And this course was Brian Harvey's 
like one of his pieces of his life work, one of the great products of, of his effort throughout the course of his life. And he did not approve. <laughs> he vocally did not approve. There's still a web page on his website about his disapproval. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he built an alternative course. He said, no, instead, 61A should be kind of frozen as it was in a self-paced course with videos of me, Brian, teaching it. And it doesn't even need an instructor. So in this view, like, I would not need to be there at all. And, um, and he built this self-paced course, like, as an alternative to 61A. And... So I think you get the idea. Here we are. There's two different courses being offered, Brian's version and my version. I'm this new person who has never taught a course. I've taught a course once before by myself. Just showed up. He's a legend. And, um, and I'm changing stuff left and right. And what does he decide to do? He offers to help me. He, in the end, he, he helped me more than any other professor. He would proofread my lecture notes. He would sit with me and tell me, students are going to get confused on this question. And here's the picture you need to draw to help them get set straight. He would tell me why I need to teach this thing before that thing. He would tell me, you know, how dare I remove this part of the course that's important. But when I did, he would help me make sure that it didn't break anything down. And other people helped too, you know, Paul Hilfinger helped a lot, David Culler helped a lot, but it was really Brian who realized, like, he's the one who's in a reasonable position to mentor me through this process of changing a course, which is an institution in this university. And even though he didn't agree with what I was doing, he decided to help me anyway, and he was like, massively helpful. So why do I call this dedication? Well, I think it was that Brian cared most of all about students and especially Berkeley students. He saw this as happening, and he wasn't willing to kind of let me fail if that meant that some students would have learned. And so, even though he had more motivation than anyone else to kind of just let me make a mess of things, his dedication to the group goal of making sure that CS education was good at Berkeley compelled him against his own like personal pride or desire to help me out. And uh, it amazed me then, it amazes me to this day, and uh, yeah, it taught me something about uh, this notion of dedication, which is something that I hold in very high esteem. So, what does that have to do with you? Well, uh, if you took 61A, then it was good because of Brian, or you hated it, and then it's my fault. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but... Also, I think you should realize that a transition happens when you leave college. Or the point of college is for you to develop yourself, for you to learn. And so it's very focused on the individual. And out there in the world, the point is to get stuff done. And like when you're in college, everyone hates group projects. Because group projects, it's like how do you assign who did what and how well they did and that's a hard problem in an environment where the whole point is individual assessment, right? But out there in the world, the point is not individual assessment. It's getting stuff done. Out there in the world, people love group projects because you can get things done with a group faster than you can get things done on your own. And it's not about how well each person did within the group. It's about whether the group succeeded. And in fact, I told you earlier that people aren't evaluated correctly anymore out there in the world. Well, oftentimes rewards and benefits and opportunities go to people who participated in a successful group. That's like what happens out there in the world. And even if that group is large and one person didn't do anything, like uh, everyone does okay out there in the world's reward system. So I guess this is another transition you gotta look out for, is that the point of college is about you, the point of the world is about getting things done, that means lots of group work, that means an opportunity to be dedicated to a common goal that might occasionally conflict with your own personal interests. And uh, 
if you're in one of those tough pickles where you're like, I'm part of this group and I want to get this group thing done, but it's not the way that I want it to be done, I don't agree with the details. Well, maybe think of Brian, and uh, and uh, what, what I find his decision to like actually help me out was a very moral decision. I mean, the benefit that he gave was that the course was better, and now like ten thousand people have taken it since he contributed to that, and that's like a real benefit to the world. So that's dedication. Okay, uh, last last uh, lesson. Purpose. I'm gonna talk about my kid. My son Ian just turned three years old. And have you been around a three-year-old? Like <laughs> when I was your age, I had no idea. Like, can three-year-olds talk? Can they walk? <laughs> now I know. A three-year-old can run, he can jump, he can climb, he can tell you all about things, he can ask all kinds of questions. Um and Like, some of the questions that he's starting to ask now are really hard to answer. I was hiking with him the other day, and he said, Why does the raccoon sleep all day and only come out at night? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's nocturnal. Why? <laughs> so, I guess I was supposed to explain evolution at this point. <laughs> I did not do. I, uh, I said they have big eyes so they can see at night. <laughs> I was quite pleased with this answer. <laughs> I was pleased until I realized the consequences of this answer, where he, he responded, I have big eyes too. <laughs> And for the last week, he's refused to go to bed. <laughs> and he now like naps during the day so that he can stay up at night. <laughs> so I learned something from my own kid. And what I learned is interesting. It's that he really likes to help. He's like compelled to help. So if I'm watering the plants, then he wants to hold the watering can. If uh, I'm washing knives in the sink, he wants to grab the knife. I mean, <laughs> whatever it is that I'm doing that seems like useful work, he wants to participate in. And um, that's like interesting, right? I wonder why does he do this? And as far as I can tell, it's not something we train him to do. It's just kind of like spontaneous desire to help. And we put him in a a Montessori school, which is like a type of school that uh, really focuses on students like doing chores, basically. <laughs> doing chores. <laughs> and he's helpful there too. And they have an expert, yeah, it's, it's true, like we pay tuition so that our kid can be a janitor. <laughs> you know, he sits in there and he does, he does things and he waters plants and he sweeps the floor and something. <laughs> <laughs> but they have a good story for why a kid should do these chores, and it's that um, it helps improve concentration, like do work. Okay. It helps improve motor skills. Okay. But also, it gives the children a sense of purpose and belonging because they can participate in some helpful act. Whoa, pretty good school. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, this idea kind of resonates with me. That even the three-year-old is compelled to be helpful, and maybe that being helpful somehow gives him a sense of purpose. And the school claims, it's not just one school, but a tradition of schools claims that this helps with self-confidence and self-esteem because uh, you know, you're doing something useful in the world. Um, I guess one quirk is that this notion of like sense of purpose from helping others 
seems like it's missing from economic theory, at least as I learned it when I was an undergrad 20 years ago. It's uh, uh, economic theory is about rational choices. Choices are about uh, outcomes and the value of outcomes to the person who's making the choice and the chance that the outcome will actually happen from the decision. And um, yeah, I mean, there's like really nice theory that shows you that under like certain assumptions, like a rational consumer will behave as if there is a function, a utility function that just assigns for every outcome some amount of utility or reward that describes how desirable this thing is to the person choosing. So it's all about like if there's a car and there's a lollipop and there's a sandwich. Uh, and you know, if you enter a lottery where you might win this, but with a low chance, and you might get the sandwich with a high chance, is that better than just taking the lollipop? I mean, that's like a, that's kind of the the setting in which all this theory is developed. It's about like what the individual gets from making choices, and a lot of how people describe human behavior in an economic sense is based on this uh, utility theory. And like, if you've learned about utility theory in college. That's good, I think. If you haven't, it's like one of those beautiful ideas that people should be exposed to in college. If you haven't, you're not panicked. You can continue to learn things after college. <laughs> it's like books out there, too. <laughs> so, uh, you learn about utility theory. Like read Wikipedia or whatever. Um, but this idea that you would like gain a sense of purpose from helping others is sort of missing from that story of how rational people should make decisions. And um, yeah, what do you do with this fact? Well, I think we should just accept people for who they are. You know, observe them, see how they behave. And uh, a three-year-old behaves not just trying to get as many lollipops as possible, but uh, seems to be gaining satisfaction and self-confidence, and from this sense of purpose that comes from just like helping helping you know, sweep the schools for. Uh, so I, I think if you really squint, maybe you can claim that this is part of utility theory, that like you should try to get the satisfaction of sweeping someone else's floor. But I don't buy it. Like, I think that's really stretching the, the concepts that were laid out there. Instead, there's just something else that drives people, this sense of uh, belonging, of helping someone else with a common goal or a common purpose. Three-year-olds like it. I like it too. I think it's um, it might be something fundamental that, that people shouldn't neglect. So I guess I would point out that it's not something that you need to obsess over or only do all the time. Like uh, when Ian is jumping on his trampoline, he's not thinking about being helpful. He's just like thinking about jumping, and mm -hmm. like, he loves to jump. And it's only when he's in like the right environment, when he's witnessing somebody else that he knows doing something that seems <laughs> useful, that he's compelled to help out. Otherwise, he's just jumping, and that's fine too. So there's like a mix of both in his life, and it's like minute to minute. He's either jumping, and then he's helping sweep, and then he's back up. <laughs> but like, of course, like adults live on a longer time scale. But I wonder if uh, we shouldn't make sure that adults have a similar kind of balance between just doing stuff that's for them and doing stuff that gives them a sense of purpose. And uh, how might that go? Well, I, I guess my concern is that college doesn't really give you uh, that many opportunities to be helpful and contribute to a common goal that's not really your own goal. And that's not a bad thing. Like, the point of college is to develop yourself. You can go, like, do useful stuff later. But, and sometimes college students do find a way to be helpful while they're there. Like they you know, teach or help a friend or part of a club that's doing something important or volunteering. I think that's all great. And if you don't do that, I think that's okay too. Um, because the point of college is not to do stuff, it's to learn how to do stuff. But, but it's also not as okay in the sense, and this is not like me judging you for not being helpful. This is a concern for your well-being that if uh, you don't ex have enough exposure to opportunities to be helpful, to contribute to a common goal inside of a community, then maybe you lose that chance 
to have a sense of purpose and belonging that comes from doing that helpful thing. Um, and yeah, so is this like actionable advice? I'd say like out there in the world, make sure that you don't spend all your time just like looking out for your own benefits and you know trying to get rich and famous. You can do that with lots of your time, but uh, there's a risk that if you get too far into that path, then you won't leave enough time for the sense of purpose that comes from helping others. And perhaps more importantly, I don't think you should be shy about asking other people for help. Like, talk about what you care about. Talk about what you're interested in and tell others. And say, hey, you can help me out if you want. Now, like, it, it, it is imposing if you expect them to help you out for free right now, right? But if you just ask, if you just tell people what you're up to and offer, the, offer to let them help you out, that's not a bad thing at all. That might actually be giving others that you care about an opportunity to have this fulfilling sense of doing something useful for others. So uh, try that. See you goes. Uh, okay, I've talked a lot. I think I'm going to wrap up, but um, let's see. Today's my birthday. It's big. I'm, I'm 39, so. It's been a pretty good day. Uh, my GSIs give me a cake. Aww. Not just like any cake, they give me a Shinky Bakery cake. <laughs> and Ian, the kid, he likes birthdays. He's, he's sung happy birthday to me about 12 times. <laughs> so you might wonder, like, why am I here on the night of my birthday? Should I be like, celebrating or something? I gotta tell you, I get a lot of satisfaction out of this idea that I could help you just make a, a little bit of sense out of the chaos in the world and think about this idea of dedication and, um, yeah, maybe, maybe find room in your life for a shared sense of purpose and helping out. Because, if, you know, if that makes a difference in your life, then, then I've done something useful with mine. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of why I teach at Cal, is for moments like these. So I really do appreciate that you shared it with me. Um, I, I hope it wasn't too preachy. Like, there's plenty of time in life for doing your own thing and plenty of time for trampolines. But, uh, <laughs> but if you want to you know, think about these details of participating in community and all that, I think it really could uh, enrich your life in a positive way. So with that, I'll just say congratulations and call it.
won't be standing people and that sample can be by discounts at different bars. So just make sure to get that can and uh, yeah. All right. And remember, well, and also we have an event after this at SPAS, which will also feature some other events and merch. If you're interested, go by there as well. So, now for the raffle. Okay, every number is 910184. Please come up. <laughs> I think I can end the video now, right? What? I can probably end this now.